we're going to break away from the stewardship series. We've been hitting that pretty hard for the past, you know, several weeks, and I kind of want to just step back because there's still a ways to go through it, and I don't want to just do the same, you know, approach every single week. Um, but, but you know, in our in these recent studies, we've spent a lot of time and energy focusing on our growth, and that's a really good thing to do. Uh, and what I've discovered over the years is that when I work really hard for a long time, for long hours in my job, uh, throughout the week, my body needs to rest at, and, and reset. And what happens when we hit that place of rest is that we give our bodies and our minds a chance to, to repair the damage done from the work week. And, and once we do that, we can come back refreshed and stronger for the new tasks ahead. And that's, so that's kind of my thought process. I'm saying, okay, let's, let's just take a break from it a little bit. Um, so what better way to rest than to read Psalm 23? I mean, there really isn't any, any better way in my opinion. And that's obviously the scripture that we're going to be looking at today. And it's appropriately named, The Lord is My Shepherd. So let's take a look at Psalm 23. And we're going to be looking at just the first three verses this week. Uh, in the second three verses next week. There it is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. This is probably the most well-known and loved uh, chapter or, 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 or psalm in all of the Old Testament. I, I mean, everybody has heard it most generally, and pretty much everybody knows it. It's short, it's to the point. But somebody once said that this psalm has flown like a bird up and down the earth, singing the sweetest song ever heard. It has softly given more heavy hearts rest than all the philosophies of the world. It will go on singing to our children and to their children till the end of time. And when its work is done, it will fly back to the arms of God, fold its wings, and sing on forever in the happy choir of those it had helped bring there. See what I'm talking about when I, when I say just take a break and step back and rest. Today we're going to, again, look at the first three verses um, and, and continue through the rest of it next week, and, and after that we'll get back to the stewardship series. But David, the author, most likely wrote this while he was a shepherd watching over the flocks of his father. On the very same field where, a thousand years later, the angel choir announced the birth of Jesus to the unsuspecting shepherds tending their flocks. Geographically, it was most likely the same spot. I'm not going to get into all the details on that. We'd be here too long. But I found that extremely interesting. So looking at Psalm 23, verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Throughout the process of studying and seeking to grow into Christ's likeness, it can sometimes become easy to begin to feel like, we're the ones responsible for the process of growth. So if we don't see the result of our effort, it can be a little discouraging, can it? We can start feeling like, well, I'm doing all this stuff, but I'm still struggling here. I'm still struggling there. How come I'm not seeing any major transformation? And I actually dealt with that years ago. I always felt like, you know, I, I got to get this right. Someday, somehow, what am I doing wrong? Well, realistically... You're not responsible for your growth. You're responsible to put the work in, but the growth comes from the Lord. 
resting in the knowledge that the Lord is our shepherd or our guide uh, and ultimately the one who will bring us to a, the place that we're going, the place that we're seeking to get to, gives us an assurance that growth is happening even if we don't see it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He will bring it to completion. Knowing that he will bring it there gives me rest in the depths of my being because I know he's got this. Isn't it nice to rely on somebody else for things to get done? When I started... Um, yeah, I'm in charge of a lot of things. I'm sure that's a surprise to you. I just, I'm always doing something. I'm always, you know, and that's kind of the way it's always been for me. And, and so when I started <clears throat> training with a, a, a friend of mine up in the city for uh, just, just like learning how to work out and, and learn how to do it better uh, for my, my health sake, um, I went to him and I said, you know, I appreciate the fact that I don't have to be in charge of this. I just have to show up and do the work. You know, and I, I didn't realize at the time how profound that was and how much it correlates with this. It's the same idea. It's like Jesus is our personal trainer. He's going to get us through it. We might not see immediately the results we're hoping for, but they're happening nonetheless. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. I love this verse because it paints a picture of what God is doing. He will tend. He will gather. He will carry and gently lead. He will do these things. It takes the pressure off, doesn't it? Knowing he's the one doing it. And I, I got news for you, and I know it's not news for you. He's almighty. There's nothing he can't do. So there's nothing in our lives that he cannot bring us through and overcome for us. Any area that we're looking at and saying, you know what, I'm struggling here. This is hard for me. I need to overcome this, but I don't know how. That's okay. He does. Hallelujah for that. The second half of Psalm 23.1 says, I shall not want. Now, because I know that Christ is doing these things and is my shepherd, I will lack nothing that I need. So Christ, who is guiding us on our journey through life, will be our provider for our necessities. Again, this is not a, this is not a promise that we will have everything we want. Okay, Jesus isn't like you know, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, whatever you whatever you say, he's obligated to do somehow. That's not what this is saying, okay? There is a mentality, even, a, even a, a, a theology, I wouldn't really call it that, but there's a philosophy out there that says God is obligated to you through faith. So therefore, if you believe well enough that he's going to give you a mansion in the hills or a Porsche 911 Turbo, mm -hmm. oh, I'd love to have that. Mm -hmm. I got one for Christmas. It, it was Legos, you know. <laughs> <put it together. laughs> it was fun. I loved it, but it wasn't the real thing, and that's okay. But, um, you know, that philosophy that says God, was, God is somehow obligated to us through, because we have faith that he's going to do that, who does that put in the driver's seat? Us. Right? If, 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 if I can say, okay, God, I believe that you're going to give that to me, you are not obligated to do it, he is our servant at that point, and we are the Lord. So that's backwards. Okay? But he will provide our necessities because he loves us. We can rest assured knowing that Christ will meet our physical, spiritual, and emotional needs and we will have no lack of necessity. This speaks to his ability to fulfill his position as provider in our lives. Back, and I've talked about this before, but I'm going to mention it again because not everybody has heard about it. But back in 2012, I became crippled and I lost everything. We lost everything. My business, my livelihood, my ability to walk without assistance. And again, that's a story for another time that I've already shared. But 
But mind you, during that time, I had three little kids this year. <coughs> they were all small, they all needed food, they all needed shelter and clothing and so on. During the darkest hours and the most difficult circumstances that we experienced because of that, we never missed a meal. Not one time. There was no lack. Uh, you know, we never had to sleep on the street. God provided every single day, every step of the way for our necessities. We didn't have an abundance, but we didn't have any lack of basic needs. And, and, and God was shepherding <laughs> us and, and watching over us and filling, fulfilling faithfully his position as our caretaker. And that was amazing. And to watch that happen is a tangible evidence of his presence in your life. And if you've never experienced it, pray for it. Pray that God shows that to you. If you're stressed out about, hey, where's the electric bill money going to come from? Throw it on, on, on him and say, what will you please provide this? You know, not, again, not the name and claim thing, but go to him and humbly and say, Lord, I need this. He yeah. knows you need it. It's there for the asking. It really is. He was there to give me rest and my family protection and to care and provide for us during that time. And, and through that, it eventually brought me to a place of spiritual and physical health, watching what he was doing. He also miraculously healed my crippling injury. But again, that's a story for another time. Moving forward in our main uh, section of scripture this morning, Psalm 23, verse 2 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. Have you ever driven down through the, through the lake country? Have you ever been down? I'm sure all of us have. You know? Especially in like the, uh, <clears throat> the fall. I love going through there and seeing all the, the beautiful trees and stuff, the different colors. I mean, actually, people drive here from other states to see that. That's how awesome it is. I love to watch that while I'm going through there. Sometimes I'm on my motorcycle. I know that's a big surprise, right? I love it. It's so freeing. It's, it's the closest thing to flying that I can imagine is being on a bike. And some of you can relate to that. Some of you are like, you're nuts. And you're right. You know, you're right. It is a crazy thing to do. Um, but being out in that environment and seeing the beauty that God has created, the stillness, the peacefulness of it, 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 it draws me into a place of uh, you know, seeing God in, in his majesty and, and, and watching like just, just that peaceful breeze that blows around. I mean, I, I know you can picture it. Uh, have you ever been up to Harriet Hollister? Up on, you know, anywhere that overlooks Honeyoy Lake? Just before I went to Paraguay last year, Lindsay and I took a bike ride out there. And of course, there was some friction between us because she didn't want me to go. I was not wanting to go either. Uh, but I knew that the Lord, we both knew that the Lord was calling us to do that. And so it was a difficult thing. We had never been apart from each other for any huge amount of time. So that was a, a big undertaking. But going up there and just overlooking the beauty of what God had created and watching you know, just the stillness of it, the rest of it, how it, how it was peaceful. It helped that situation that we were dealing with. When I read this verse, that's what I think of. That's the place I go to, you know, gi giving us, you know, lying down in green pastures and being led by still waters, right? If, if you don't have a place like that, if you can't think of something like that, I encourage you to find it. And, and I, I've heard people say, well, that's where, that, you know, that's where I commune with God. That's okay. If you go out in a place like that and you meet God there, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I encourage you to do it because you get alone with him. He nourishes our spirits in that context. He gives us, he fills our hearts and our minds. And, and, and you know, even when our circumstances are not as lovely and as peaceful as what we've just talked about, what we've just imagined, he still can give us that peace when we need it. Even when all you know, craziness is happening around us. Now, we know that circumstances, they're not always peaceful. 
They're not always like that, but he can give us peace, even when the world around us offers none. Again, it's there for the asking. Philippians 4, 7 says, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Years ago, um, when Lindsay and I were first dating, we used to um, grab my dad's canoe, go down to Hemlock Lake, and, and go uh, paddling. One, one day, we, we paddled all the way down to the south end from the north end. And there was this like gentle breeze, you know, kind of pushing us down there. It was really cool, you know. It, I think it took like two hours to get down there paddling. When we got down there, the weather exploded, and there was white caps coming back. We, it took like four hours to paddle back. <laughs> and we had to stay right next to the shore because it was crazy. Yeah, it was nuts. And, I, and, and, and poor Lindsay at the time, she was just this you know, little 17-year-old girl, and she was trying, and then she'd get all tired. So I'm sitting in the back like, all right, I got to man up. You know, I got to get us home. <laughs> so, so, you know, so that was one of our experiences. But, th but this one particular day, we got down there, and the water was being a little questionable. So after having that first experience, we're like, you yeah, know, let's pray about this. And we're like, Lord, will you, will you please calm the waters? Will you, will you just bring a stillness for us? And it, it didn't happen right away, but about halfway across the lake, because we were going you know, across it, not down at this time, the, the whole lake just stopped. It was, like, it was like we were on a mirror. It was incredible. I mean, and there was no sound. There was just, it was just like this huge blanket of peace just fell all around us. And we knew that God had answered that prayer. We're like, this is incredible. And just like, the only thing you could hear was the sound of that paddle cut through the water. And it was almost like you didn't even want to say anything because it was just that, you didn't want to break the silence, you know? That was a touching point for us with God to, to where he was just like, yeah, I'm here. I, I heard you, I got this. It was incredible. And actually, I think about it, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen before or since that lake ever be that, that peaceful, ever. It's, it was incredible. But again, God was showing us himself and the reality of his answer to our prayer was astonishing and undeniable. So moving forward, Psalm 23, verse 3, a, so the first part of three. He restores my soul. Did you know God is in the business of restoration? Amen. 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 There's not a one of us that can stand here and say, since I've known Jesus as my Lord, I'm the same as I was before I met. No, you can't. There's nobody that can say that. Not at all. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's his character. Back in 2015, during the midst of my crippling injury, God gave me a verse, because I was struggling. I was having such a hard time going through being crippled, right, not being able to get around without a cane in, in my knee brace. It was so hard and heavy for me to deal with that, that God wanted to remind me that he was there. And, and, and I needed to, speak. I was struggling to make sense out of my life. Like, what do I do with it? At this point, what do I do? I, I can't work. I couldn't do anything. He, he gave me this verse, and when I read it, you know, I knew he was speaking to me in a time when I needed hope. It's uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among them. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. God used the difficult experience that I had so he could show me his, his goodness. Now that's not to say God caused that to happen, okay? But he was there for for me when it did. Okay? That's that's a big that's a big deal. Okay, I'm never gonna point my finger at God and say, look at what he did. He did something bad to me. That's that's 
not something that's whatever God does is what God does who am I you know who am I to say but I know that when I experience difficult situations and that's going to happen why because we live in a fallen world and that's just the nature of it but he is there to get us through it and he uses those situations in our life as a backdrop to, uh, to contrast his goodness for us when we look into the clear night sky, when there's no clouds and it's just, you know, beautiful and peaceful out, we can see all the bright shining stars as they contrast against the darkness. Many ocean-going ships have navigated safely at night because of this. And so it is with the goodness of God in the darkness of our despair, his character shines against the backdrop of our difficult situations and he is glorified when he brings the restoration into our lives that only he can bring. I, I love that. I love that about him. And not only do I love that about him, but I love that I can see that in what he's doing in my life. And again, when you're facing something difficult, I encourage you to look for it. Ask him for it. Because he's going to be there. Even though I went through these difficulties, his plan was always to bring restoration to me. And in that moment, when I needed to sit down and read those, that verse, those verses, he knew I needed to remember his goodness. Because it's really easy to get your eyes on your circumstances and off of him. The second half of Psalm 23, 3 says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The Lord chooses the paths that our life will follow. He sets us on a trajectory. He chooses paths that will produce the outcome for us that please him and are right for us. And that's different for everybody. Why? Because we're unique. We have different experiences, different cultural backgrounds, different abilities. And everybody, there's no two people that are the same. So everybody's trajectory and path is going to be different. <clears throat> he does it for his name's sake in, in accordance with his revealed character. Psalm 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. So God establishes our way, causing us to be firmly planted when our way delights him. And we know that the lifestyle that delights God is that of righteousness. Mm. Therefore, our shepherd, as he leads us in our journey of life, of, of becoming like him, even in those uh, paths, uh, sometimes those paths are difficult, aren't they? Well, if everything was always easy, would you ever get stronger? Okay, let's, let's think about that. If, if I went to the gym every day and I always just lifted the bar, am I going to get stronger? <laughs> No, <laughs> I won't. I have to add weight to that sometimes. Sometimes i got to push real hard. Sometimes it's going to be super difficult. And I see in, our, in the karate school, I see a progression with our students. They start out as white belts, and you know they're always like wiggly and, and soft. right? <clears throat> By the time they, they, they're done hanging out with us for a couple of years, they're not looking like that anymore. They're strong, you know, and, and, and because we make them crawl up and down the floor and do all these crazy things. Right? And I make it progressively more difficult for them. You see, yeah, they're laughing because they're like, yes, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got to come for karate. I encourage you. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the point is, you know, the Lord will lead us through difficulties, right? Giving us, causing us to be able to get stronger. And he does that so, so he can bless us and establish us. Let's look at Luke, chapter 8, verses 22 through 25a. One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, 
where is your faith? But Jesus said to his disciples that they were going to cross the lake. Now, as they crossed the lake, as they were in the process of doing what he said, they found themselves in mortal danger. What? What? Why would Jesus do that? He's going to kill us. Was it really? Is that what he said was going to happen? Or did he say to cross the lake? Right? Hmm. Their plea, or at their plea, he rebuked the storm. He stopped it right in its tracks. And, and then he asked them, where's your faith? Now, sometimes I look at this as though he's like rebuking them. But was he? Was he, was he mad at them? I don't think so. I think he was using this as a moment to put a contrast between what was happening around them and what he said. Contrasting his, the word of God to circumstances around you. Interesting, right? So I don't think he was mad. I think he was using this as a teaching moment. Why? Because he's Jesus. And everything he does taught us something. He wanted their faith to be in his word. And his word to them was to cross the lake, not to sink halfway across. He didn't say, let's, cross, let's go halfway across and boom, you know, that wasn't what he said. <laughs> he did not want their faith to be in the uncertainty of the storm. Now, if we have our eyes on the uncertainty of the storm, what are we putting our faith in? When fear fills us, what are we counting on? We're counting on the bad thing to happen. We're expecting death. We're expecting doom. So where's your faith? Your faith is in the fact that you're going to die. Right? You know, what you got to... So Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm trying to contrast this for you. I'm trying to make you understand. I said this was going to happen. Therefore, that's what's going to happen. And you, you called on me and boom. It's all over with. He put a complete and total stop to it. The character of his disciples would have been dramatically changed in that moment. They realized in an instant that the power of his word was greater than anything the world had to throw at them. And that was pretty serious, okay? There wasn't any lifeboats, there wasn't any little island you could jump off to, and you're certainly not going to swim out of that when those waves are coming up. I mean, we're talking about some crazy stuff here. They're, they're saying we're perishing. These are seasoned fishermen. They've seen some pretty nasty weather. So for it to have been that violent of a storm that they were terrified of death tells you what, si what sort of storm this would have been. This would have been tremendously scary. Jesus demonstrated his faith in God the Father and therefore demonstrated the character of God through faith in a dangerous and difficult situation. And it was a situation he brought them into. But his plan was to bring them through it. Okay? Again, it doesn't mean he caused the storm. It means he was with them through it. He then asked them, where, asking them, where is your faith? Not because he didn't know where their faith was, but so that they could see his demonstration of, being, of calling on God in a terrible situation and, 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 and moving in that faith so that they could learn how to do it. Remember, we've been talking about, we talked about discipleship, watching your teacher. This is an example of that. Thus he led them in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, because moving as he moved brought glory to God the Father, and his power was revealed through the character of Christ. And then that character was now the character of of the disciples. Isn't that cool? I, I read that. I was like, man, i got to read my Bible more often because I'm just seeing these things happen and it's like, cool. All right, so they were learning to walk as Christ walk, walked and he led them as a shepherd. Such is the same for us. Our experiences, our testimony, peaceful nature, restful, restored souls, an established way of life is a living witness to those around us as to the character of Christ our Lord, who is in us. As he lives in us and models for us his example. Are we, are we, are we grabbing a hold of this? Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it's almost like, like, you know, it's just this continuous thing. And then we just keep growing in it and we keep growing in it. 
The more we put in, the more we get out. Take time in your busy week to get into the presence of God and His Word. While you are there, look for these examples. Okay? The Bible is living. It's alive. And when we go to it, it's better than television because the depth of your understanding when you watch a television program is, is, is just, it's whatever they want you to see, and it's limited. When we go to the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit starts speaking to us and showing us what Jesus is doing in the things that he's, he's, he's showing us, there's no limit to the depth of our understanding at that point. It, is, it isn't just this flat screen, okay? It's an actual living experience, and it changes us. It, 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 and being in his presence is what gives us that rest. Mm -hmm. I can rest today knowing that he is the one doing in me what needs to be done to change me into his character. I can rest in that. I am sure of it.